Philippians 3, verses 1 through 11. Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, count them as rubbish, in order that I might gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Thus ends the reading of God's word. As withers and the flower fades, the word of our God will stand forever. Have you ever heard a humble brag? Have you ever heard someone complain as they brag? I heard the story uh, the other week of a parent complaining about all the practices and tournaments that their talented children had to be in. And then COVID came along, and then they complained, oh, now we're not able to do all those things. Which is it? And here we have what seems bragging and moral righteousness, and that might seem foreign to us, but just because we don't brag about our moral righteousness doesn't mean that we don't brag. And without realizing it, we brag about who we're associated with. Have you ever dropped somebody's name? What food laws we adhere to, organic, gluten-free, free-range, quarter cow, fair trade, ethically sourced. (laughs) We define our righteousness by and then boast in our political distinctives, our theological distinctives, our responsibilities at work, the makeup of our home. And there's even a new gauge of our goodness calculated through friends, likes, subs. But even those who are most devoted to their own ascendancy in social media, sports, business, religion, or family find that it's lonely and empty at the top. This is why so many Olympic athletes struggle with anxiety and uh, depression, why millionaires kill themselves, why business and religious leaders eventually fall. All of these forms of righteousness fail us. They don't provide a good enough assurance to assuage our soul of its sin. We can be the best at things for a short time. (laughs) But even our best is not very impressive to God. And after a while, we realize we're not fooling ourselves and we're certainly not fooling God. We need a righteousness from outside. But a righteousness from outside is not a righteousness we can brag about. If someone gives us righteousness, it feels false to look down on others and congratulate ourselves. And so this is why so many turn back to self-righteousness, because it affords us a small measure of pride. But look out for self-righteousness. True righteousness comes through faith in Jesus Christ. Righteousness from God, being declared righteous in the highest court in the universe, by the most stringent measure for righteousness, comes through faith in Jesus. 
whether you are righteous and can consider yourself righteous and be righteous in the eyes of God fundamentally depends on who you have faith in, yourself or Jesus. And so to understand what this faith looks like, we need to look at the antithesis of faith. The antithesis of faith is self-righteousness. And Paul warns the Philippians about this danger in strident terms. Paul demonstrates very clearly what self-righteousness would look like. Self-righteousness looks like putting confidence in the flesh, thinking that you're able to attain righteousness through your own body, through your own doings. Self-righteousness looks to one's pedigree to show how great one is. Paul speaks of his own circumcision on the eighth day to show how even his parents were seeking to obey God precisely. And Paul is from a family that knew the true God when Paul was born. Paul from an early age was raised strictly according to God's principles. And being thankful for your upbringing and boasting about your upbringing are two different things. But what greater boast could you have than saying that you were one of God's people at birth and ever since? Self-righteousness name drops. And for rhetorical effect, Paul paints a picture of the antithesis of faith, boasting in your lineage and fleshly connection to greatness. Israel, who he says he's related to, wrestled with God personally. I'm not talking about the nation, I'm talking about the person. Benjamin, the person, was a favored son, and then his tribe was chosen for the first king in Israel. How much choice do we have of the family that we're born into? Yet lineage frequently is a boast of the self-righteous. But it gets you nowhere with God. Paul mentions his people group, the Hebrews, to reveal how self-righteousness works. It boasts in its people group. Self-righteousness is racist. My heritage is better than your heritage. Whether 50 years ago it was white or 50 days ago it was black, boasting in our heritage gets us nowhere with God. He can see through what society may be so enamored with at the time. And if we have righteousness, it is in spite of our people group. Our heritage is nothing to boast about. Paul mentions his devotion to the law, which would otherwise be a good thing. The psalmist talks about how his delight is in the law. We read that earlier. Loving the law only turns into a bad thing when we look to the law to justify us before others. The law may be our delight, but it cannot be our boast. God sees. Paul's desire to justify himself even led him to be a persecutor of the church. Persecution always comes out of the corner of self-righteousness. Self-confidence is weak. It must tear others down to build itself up. Self-righteousness persecutes because it can't grasp true righteousness on its own. It must kneecap, hamstring, cut down, slander in order to ascend. And this is the antithesis of true righteousness. It's the world's righteousness. It is religious righteousness. It is critical race theory righteousness. It is not true righteousness. Paul argues that true righteousness is spiritual righteousness, not physical circumcision, but spiritual circumcision. Righteousness does not consist in outward appearances, but inward obedience. It isn't about being tall. True righteousness is about standing out from the crowd through your stand for the truth. More than seeing over people's heads, righteousness perceives the truth when others refuse to see it. Better than looking like a leader, like Saul, is being a leader who steadfastly follows the Lord and so leads other men. You might ask, why is Pastor Nick talking about height? Saul was head and shoulders above the Israelites, and so the Israelites wanted him as their first king, which was worldly. And the Saul who wrote this letter was converted under the powerful influence of Christ and was renamed Paul, which means small. When we become small, 
God can become great in our lives. Beware of those, liberal or conservative, who judge themselves legitimate by worldly standards. This is the antithesis of faith. Faith puts its hope in something unseen, something only hoped for, something not easily grasped, checked off, or completed. Faith is humble because it points to something outside itself for justification. Self-righteousness, by contrast, points to itself one way or another. So the antithesis of faith is confidence in the flesh, self-righteous security in the outward trappings of religion rather than the faith of the heart. One quick side note on Paul's spirit-inspired decision to call his opponents, did you hear what he called them? Evildoers, dogs. First of all, what's so bad about dogs? Sheesh. Such terminology may seem hyperbolic and mean, but compared with the real spiritual damage that false teachers wreck on lives, families, and generations, Paul's terminology is tame. However, use extreme caution when taking such terminology upon your lips. Make sure you're absolutely correct and not merely guilty of what you're accusing another of. Faith, to understand faith, we, understand, we have to understand the object of our faith. So where does this leave us? If the righteousness of the best is as dirty rags, what hope is there for us? And if, if the answer comes back, we can be justified by faith. We say, oh, thank goodness. But another question remains. Does it matter what we have faith in? Will any religion do? Do we just need to have faith in something, someone greater than ourselves, a greater, a higher power? Should we amend the gospel from believe in the Lord Jesus to believe on? That's Baltimore's gospel. It absolutely matters what you have faith in. In fact, you can have very little faith, yet have it in the right place, and it will do more good than having a whole lot of faith in the wrong object. The example is given that you can have a great deal of faith that you've bought the winning lotto ticket. You can believe that you've won with all your heart, every fiber of your being, but it's very unlikely. On the contrary, if you're feeling very unsure of God's sovereign rule and the return of Jesus, no matter how little you believe that, it's going to happen. So what's most critical is that the object of your faith is sturdy, true, and sure. And the object of faith for Paul was Jesus. Verse 2, we are those who glory in Christ. Verse 7, for the sake of Christ. Verse 8, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord for his sake, that I might gain Christ. Verse 9, through faith in Christ. Verse 10, that I may know him. True faith has an object, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the power source that faith connects us to. And through connection to Jesus, we have righteous power over sin, God's righteous judgment on our behalf. And you can know that a power source, you know a power source is worthless unless one has a reliable extension cord to connect the power to where it's needed. And you know that a reliable extension cord is no good unless you have a power source. Jesus is the power source of our righteousness, and faith connects us to him. The object of our faith is not ourselves. Christians are not confident in themselves and their own righteousness. And if you are ready to admit this, there are two immediate logical corollaries. Number one, you have no reason to boast or look down on others morally. Everyone who is righteous is righteous in the same way, through faith in Christ. It makes no sense to congratulate ourselves and denigrate others based upon our morals, our beliefs, our execution of those beliefs, when all our righteousness comes from Jesus for us, for them. 
to do a, a, a mental exercise to test your resolve on this matter, think of the worst sinner that you can think of. You deserve the same punishment, death, and hell as them. And you both gain righteousness the same way through Jesus' shed blood. And if you can say amen to that, you're halfway there. The second half is to admit that if righteousness only happens through Jesus' shed blood, righteousness is found no other way. There's no other way into heaven than through perfect righteousness. Jesus is the only way. There are no morally good people apart from Christ. There is no other way into heaven besides Jesus. No amount of asserting that love wins or everybody will be given a second chance makes it so. That is not what scripture teaches. And when false teachers vacillate on soteriology, they're trying to be more gracious than God. But God will require a reckoning for rejecting his one and only son, Jesus. So when you're giving a defense for your faith, you don't need to apologize for God's divine plan of salvation. You don't need to explain it away. You don't need to give false assurances. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Boldly proclaim this as God's truth. And cling all the more desperately to God because he is your only hope of salvation. And as you cling to him, rejoice. Thanks be to God that he chose you in Christ. Thanks be to God that he gives you righteousness, that he counts your faith as righteousness. What grace is here? Hallelujah. Finally, the, res the result of faith. See, opponents of the doctrines of grace allege that if we teach salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, people will sin more. They'll presume on God's grace and take personal holiness for granted. And I've heard some claim that the result of righteousness through faith is worldliness. And I've been tempted in my own heart to think that salvation by faith removes consequences from sin and therefore makes it easier to deal with impurity. But what does Paul say the result of faith is? Verses 8 and 9. We gain Christ and are found in him. Verse 10. We know Christ and the power of his resurrection. We share in his sufferings. And verse 11. We attain resurrection from the dead. So which is it? Is the result of faith resurrection and knowledge of God, or is the result of faith an increase of sin? What the Bible says bears out in reality and experience. Which strategy gains Christ and causes people to be found in him? Works righteousness or Christ's righteousness? Have you met works righteousness people? They look down on others. They're judgy. They're hypocritical rules lawyers. They're controlling, nitpicking, and uninspiring. By contrast, those who live by faith freely confess their sin. They know posing is weak and lame. They're uninterested in cutting down others. It doesn't make them feel better about themselves. It only makes them feel dirty. They're gracious in the conduct that they take off of others. They're low-key. They're quiet. The way they righteousness is much more with their hands than with their mouths. Do you know what I mean? They talk less, but they do more. Why? Because they know that if you look at their record, you'll find sin. You'll find need. You'll find brokenness. It has been said, that sinners make the best saints. People who call sin, sin, make the best saints. People who admit their sin make the best saints. People who need Jesus more make better saints. Acknowledge sinners. Live by faith in Christ's righteousness rather than a denial of their own sinfulness. 
And as we confess our sin and accept Christ's righteousness, we get to know God better. And we open ourselves up to being known by God better. How so? Look at verse 8 carefully. We know God better as we esteem every other value, gift, and ability in our life less because then we esteem Him more. Do you want to know God better? Then consider knowledge of God as more worthy than all other valid pursuits, hobbies, and callings in your life. Do you want to be known by God more deeply? Do you want to feel less alone? Then stop posing before him. Stop looking at your own merits and the markers that you set you apart as better than others. Drop it. Tell God the truth. Be honest with him today. It might sound like this. God all the ways that I have been congratulating myself and judging others, those ways are nothing but trash. I am a weak sinner. Can you love me under the bright and piercing light of your holy inspection? And if I can be honest with you, God, I can begin to be more honest with others. If I'm secure in your love, O oh God, I can take or leave the love of others because... You're all I need. God wants to know you. Will you let him know you today? And you know that that's what heaven is all about, right? It's about Jesus. It's about getting Jesus and him getting you, knowing Jesus face to face and him knowing you. The Christian isn't seeking resurrection in heaven for anything less. Not roads of gold, not lack of sadness, not even reunion with loved ones. We're seeking heaven because of Jesus. And what we gain in heaven is Christ. And to gain Christ, we don't have to wait for heaven. See, we're especially tempted to think about our own self-righteousness and listen to teachers who build up our self-righteousness when we're surrounded by people who we really look down on. But the thrust of Paul's argument should cause us to pause before we boast in our righteousness before the Lord. We're not good enough. You're not good enough. But neither was Paul. Let's compare Paul's record to that of Christ. Paul was circumcised on the eighth day. Jesus was too. More than that, his whole person was cut off and thrown in the dust on the day of his crucifixion. Paul is of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Jesus was of the actual kingly line, Judah. Jesus was the son of David, not the son of the failed king, Saul. More than that, Jesus was a far better son than any son of Israel, a far better king than any king of Judah, a better priest than any son of Levi. He's of the order of Melchizedek. Paul said, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Jesus was born in the kingly city, Bethlehem, unlike Saul of Tarsus. Where's that? Jesus could speak Hebrew, but he wasn't ashamed to speak Greek, the language of the whole Western world. Paul loves the law so much that he became a Pharisee. But Jesus lived the law in a far more winsome way than any Pharisee. No, to see today, no one wants to be a Pharisee, but millions of people want to live the law like Jesus did. Paul was zealous. But Jesus fulfilled the scripture, zeal for your house has consumed me, not by hunting humble Christians, but by addressing the money-changing power players in the temple proper. Jesus picked a bigger and better fight. As to righteousness under the law, Paul claims blamelessness. It is good to not be guilty of murder, but Jesus was far better than just not bad. Jesus was a life-giving spirit. Jesus is a life-giving spirit. Paul may have lived a blameless life for 60, 80 years. Jesus is still living and still blameless. 
Jesus' righteousness vastly outshines the righteousness of Paul. Whose righteousness do you want to stand in before a holy God? Your own or Christ's? Lay hold of Christ's righteousness through faith and trust in his finished work. Let's pray. O oh Lord Christ, it is a simple doctrine. It is a doctrine that grants us heaven. And yet, it is a doctrine that we cannot hold on to and hold on to our self-righteousness. We must lay that down. And I pray for each here that they would do business with God today on the market day of the soul, that they would exchange their self-righteousness for Christ's righteousness, that they would seek to be known by you, God, that they would stop posing before you, God, and admit their sin and come crying out to you, Lord God, for righteousness. And I pray that as they do so, it would change and refresh and renew all their relationships, that they would stop posing with others, they would definitely stop judging others, but that they would live and walk in gospel freedom, a gracious lifestyle flowing out from the grace that they have received by your doing, Lord Christ. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.